Open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. The most startling novel of the decade. Brought to the screen with uncompromising frankness, pulling no punches, knowing full well the storm it would cause. For this is a relentless, terrifying tale of five lost days and nights, torn from a man's life, bearing his heart and soul. The Lost Weekend, starring Ray Milan in one of the great performances of motion picture history. And Jane Wyman as the girl who shared his desperate journey into fear. You just happen to walk in on this. Now, if you know what's good for you, you'll turn around and walk out again and walk fast and don't turn back. Down strange forbidden byways, he wandered in search of his soul. One woman loved him too much to let him lose it. Another wanted him enough to take him without it. You do like me a little, don't you, honey? Why, Nats, Gloria, Nats. <laughs> The pod bay doors are open. Thank you for joining us once again. I'm your host, Doug Heller, film critic and film historian for TalkMovieToMe.com. Here, as always, with my co-host, Jerry Dean Roberts, film critic for ArmchairCinema.com and ArmchairOscars.com. How are you, Jerry? Please, why all this emphasis on liquids? Very dull liquids. One is too many, and a hundred is not an, an, never enough. Uh, today <laughs> we're crawling we're, inside a bottle. Today, <laughs> today we're talking about uh, Billy Wilder's one of Billy Wilder's masterpieces. Um, we finally kneel at the altar of Wilder, which is at the at, at the foot of the altar of Lubitsch, uh, with the Lost Weekend, uh, 1945 Best Picture, Director, Screenplay, and Actor. Uh, Oscar winners. Um, so how did, how did you first come to this one? I came to this one in my mad quest to see that ever won Best Picture mm-hmm. back in the early 90s. You'll hear me talk a lot about my adventures in the early 90s because that's when I really started to um, explore film beyond, you know, the cattle call of the movie theater, of the uh, multiplex. And uh, it was really... I... I, I the story of how I got to got uh, a, an obsession with the Oscars is long and really uninteresting. <laughs> so I'll just say that um, I just got this mad hair to start watching all of the best picture winners. And this was one of them. And mm-hmm. I was, I, I loved it very much. It's dated. Yeah. It works, but it, it's, it's dated in the way that it's a time capsule. Mm hmm. And uh, I can say, first of all, with confidence, I've never had this problem. This is a movie about alcoholism. I've not had this problem, neither fortunately. Have I. Yes, fortunately, and neither have I. I've never um, been in the hemisphere of this. I'm, I'm very fortunate. Mm-hmm. Um, I do occasionally have a social drink. Mm-hmm. Um, occasionally have, you know, maybe a rum and coke, but I never, it's always to taste. It's never for a buzz or even to get drunk. I I never, I never found that to be fun. (laughs) You know, I never understood the fun in that, but that was just, you know, that's just a personal thing with me. Some people like to drink and um, this movie is very much a cautionary tale 
Yeah. I mean, painted in broad colors. I mean, <laughs> my God, there's no subtlety here. There's not. <laughs> it's it's film noir, absolute film noir, and it's 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 not um, hinting at anything. No, no it 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 gives you it gives you exactly what it is right off the bat, because uh, you you're you're outside this uh, apartment complex and you go up, and there's a bottle hanging, like ten inches below the window, and then you go in and you see Ray Milland packing a suitcase, looking desperately outside the window, knowing mm-hmm. that that's where the bottle is. <laughs> like it's and that is his trajectory for the whole movie. Yeah. Yeah. That's what he wants. He wants a drink. And he's a writer, talented but not successful. This is because um, he can never finish anything because he gets drunk. Right, right. He's, and He's t- halfway to being Hemingway. He's just the wrong half. He's almost, a, he's almost a cliche. He's almost a stereotype. He's just kind of, you know, the writer who gets drunk and, you know, drinks away his paychecks and that kind of thing. And, um but it's not for nothing it's 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 not an empty portrait no. of an alcoholic it really is um he's desperate mhm and the funny thing is you're not meeting him at the beginning no you are dropped into his quandary his problem way late right 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 you're you're dropped in years into i mean even when he flashes back and says it all started three years ago uh he was an alcoholic vent he was he mm-hmm. was bringing a, a a bottle of rye to uh the opera yeah and uh sees champagne and suddenly needs a drink which i thought that that was probably the 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 most uh specious of all of the <laughs> yeah. like oh he was fine until he saw other people having liquor i don't know about that <laughs> like, only when you're around it it's like uh someone yeah. tries to give up trying, someone tries to give up smoking and they um mm. they go to a party and people are smoking and it's it's you can smell it and you mm-hmm. can you're around it and it's it, it's it's a pull you know it it is it is it, it gets your mind back on it mm. um which is which is where I kind of ended up with it while I was watching it. I'm like, you know, if he if you if you're an, if you're addicted to something, you just want it, and it, mm-hmm. it 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 it'll come up on you like a craving. But yeah, he he sees it, and then it got his mind off of the opera and back on the bottle in his pocket, which he put into his raincoat, out of his suit pocket where he could have had it with him, and just gone mm-hmm. to the bathroom and taken a nip. <laughs> <laughs> been done. Yeah, and the the coat check guy screws up because he messes the uh, the tickets, mm-hmm. and he ends up with this leopard skin woman's coat, and uh, he has to wait until the opera is over because he switched the t- the 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 guy's the tickets got switched. switched the t- yeah, he has to wait for the woman to show up to claim his coat. Mm-hmm. And, and I th- I think that that's. Uh... That's great. That's that's uh, he's he's dating, uh, or I guess is engaged to uh, the first Mrs. Ronald Reagan, Jane Wyman. Mm-hmm. Um, well, this is how they met. Yeah, this, this is this is a flashback. This is what I love about this this movie, and the way that I mean Wilder, obviously with uh, double indemnity, and he he knows his noir. Mm-hmm. Um, an ace in the hole, really. Um, he sets up this backstory with uh, Don Burnham, which is Ray Milan's character, going back and telling Nat, the bartender, like this is going to be his novel that he yeah. just hasn't started. So we get all this background information and flashback but it's wor- it's woven seamlessly into the movie so it's not just he's thinking about it he's telling the story to to Nat the bartender it's a beautiful way to get in exposition uh this could be a i would love for 
film students to study this film because if you want a basic understanding of a particular kind of story structure, mm-hmm. um, the idea that a screenplay does not have to begin at the end of time or the beginning of time. <laughs> It doesn't even have to begin when he takes his first drink. No, this is when he's taken his 5,000th drink. You're right. meeting him in the middle. You're meeting him in the middle of the disease. You're, you're meeting he's, him. He's he's 10 days sober after his last bender. Right. And all he can think about is having a drink. Right. It's and he really... does these stupid things like he, um, he, hang, he ties it to a string and hangs it out the window. And he hides it in the um, he hides his, he hides it in the light fixture, and then he gets drunk, and he can't remember where he hid it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the one that he hid in the light fixture, he finds late in the film. And right, but only because Nat said, "What about those two quarts that you had?" And he goes, yeah. two? Because he hit he hid the other one." Uh, but I love it when he's when he's searching the apartment. Um, yeah, tearing he, the apartment. He, he goes apart. to the he goes to the bathroom. He goes to a vent. He goes to the he he was hiding it in the in the bag in plants of the of the um, vacuum cleaner in plants. Mm-hmm. It's really inventive, but these were all spots that he knew he used. Yeah. Um, I think the light fixture was new. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And the only reason he sees it and figures out where it is is because the light was on and he looks up and he says and he sees the shadow cast mm. up on the ceiling. <laughs> Otherwise That's desperate. Yeah, yeah. Man, that's desperate. He's not just an alcoholic. He's hurting. Mm-hmm. He's really in the painful throes of this. This is not um you know, a guy who just has an occasional drink and drinks too much and can't tangle with it. No, he's really down to nothing. He's really down to, he's going to his favorite bar and the bartender is sick of him. Yeah. Everybody around him is sick of him. Mm -hmm. His brother is sick of him. Everybody is, they're, they're just sort of, the alcohol has taken over his life and it has, when, when you have somebody who's addicted to anything, um, they will clear out spaces in their life, important spaces in their life, for that addiction. Right. And it, and it, it here's the funny thing. You can get addicted to anything. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you can get addicted to alcohol, cigarettes, you know, anything like that. You, get a, you can get addicted to uh, food. Mm-hmm. You can get addicted. You can get addicted to porn. You can get addicted to. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can get addicted to sports. Yeah. You know anything that you do to excess, that is shoving other things out of your life so you can get to it. That's an addiction. And it becomes all you think about. And this becomes all he thinks about. Um, pushes things out of his out of his life to make space for this particular thing, which is drinking. He even gets down to the point where he goes to sell his typewriter. Right, right, because he can't get anything else. He doesn't have anything else of value to uh, to to pawn. And uh, he uh, that sequence when he's he's like looking at the typewriter and he goes, "Okay, well, but I'll never make it." It's it's two blocks away, or it's a block away. The the pawn shop is a block away. You'll Thought never make it. And then he goes to everyone on what was it seventy fifth? Uh, he just that was Third Avenue. Is Third Avenue? No, he, he lives just, on Third Avenue. Yeah, he lives on Third Avenue, and he just goes all the way up and down uh, Third. He goes up into the into the nineties. He goes. Yeah. To, <laughs> it's it's blocks and blocks and blocks and blocks, and they're all closed because it's a Jewish holiday. And uh, the non-Jewish people uh, close up <laughs> out, of a, respect, a, close out of respect up on Yom Kippur. <laughs> on Yom Kippur, and uh, the the Jewish people don't open up on on uh, St. Patrick's Day. So right, <laughs> it's an agreement that they have, uh, which is which is clever. I kind of I kind of yeah. liked that, um, but 
that's the kind of cooperation you would never get today. No, uh, no. That's the kind of cooperation <laughs> you rarely ever get then. Yeah, that's true, too. <laughs> um, but he he goes and he tries to get money from this girl that he's always flirting with at Nat's bar. Oh, is it Doris? I can't remember her name. Is it Doris? I don't, I'm not sure if it's Doris. I, yeah, I, she's very flirty. She's a, um, she's a prostitute. She's a, she's a prostitute. And, uh, uh, but she, she breaks a business date, uh, to go out with him because he builds up this whole big evening. He doesn't have the money to do it. He's just talking, because he's drunk but she believes him and he goes to her the next day she's like look <laughs> i don't ever want to see you again because i gloria I, gloria yeah I, I did all this stuff i got a facial i got uh you know my hair done nails done like i was some girl in a high school date you know mm -hmm. and uh he manages to squeeze like five or ten bucks out of her yeah falls down the steps and ends up in the drunk tank oh when he ends up in the drunk tank that's wow yeah he ends up in the what they call the alcoholic ward and um <laughs> the orderly is played by frankie phelan who played um <laughs> and it's a wonderful life mm -hmm. it was also on um Dolby gillis yeah and uh he has no bedside manner at all. Well, he's you you can tell he's been in that ward for a while. Yeah. And there's there's just he has no sympathy for for the people that uh he can definitely tell. Uh, See that guy over there comes once a month, just like the gas bill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and I mean he is he's he's got this sort of smart ass smile and he's just not he's just you know it's like I've, I've seen a million people like you you'll be back right right you'll be and back. he and he was trying to give him this the sedative so that he can sleep and he goes you know that's just uh that's for when the floor show starts yeah because the people get the dts and he's like you see that guy over there oh the yeah Beatles that guy. for him when they turn the lights off he starts uh -huh. seeing bugs in him. that guy's got a problem beyond alcohol that guy's not an alcoholic. That guy's a drug addict or some. That that guy's got a bigger problem than alcohol. If he starts seeing bugs crawling out of his bed, I mean, you know, I kept wondering what was in that rye that he was drinking because there's a point where he starts seeing a mouse come out of the wall. Mm -hmm. And when the Don goes back in, home, and the bat comes out. Well, that's that's the DTs. That's uh, when you when you see all those old uh, cartoons and and movies about the people seeing the pink elephants and stuff like that mm -hmm. uh that's when you're so dry mm -hmm. after after being addicted to anything uh alcohol drugs anything you go through this period it's the withdrawal period yeah. where the lack of the chemical starts to um play havoc with your brain chemistry mm -hmm. and you start to hallucinate yeah um that's exactly what it is he's like yeah that whole pink thing with pink elephants that's bunko it's small animals you see that yeah. guy he's got beetles so yeah that's actually that's a real thing the 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 dts the detox of, mm. um well i mean it's just like as soon as they turn the lights off he starts seeing bugs come out of the bed and it's like, <laughs> and that's what i kept thinking i was like okay it, it's it, it seemed to me it looked like, to me like he had a bigger problem than just the alcohol um but if he's seeing that every night i mean that's you know and we also should probably put this in context because this was the mid 40s people did not see alcoholism as a disease or as a problem to solve right this was this was really kind of a revolutionary picture there there really weren't too many that dealt with excessive drinking as a health problem mm. this is probably the first one that actually treats addiction like a disease right um, although it doesn't call it that it does not it does not um well it's it's kind of the same uh the same thing as uh what the best years of our lives that uh 
basically PTSD. introduced PTSD without calling it any kind of a disorder. You know, the this um the solution was to stop drinking. Pretty much, yeah. It's there's no there's no uh twelve step program. There's no um you know, ways to get your mind off it. It's just you can stop anytime you want. You just don't want to, so we're gonna make you. AA did exist. Um, AA was founded in Akron, Ohio, in 1935, mm-hmm. so it was around. But I think it wasn't until maybe the 70s when this really became um, identified as a health issue, and people really did start to go to those um, to mm-hmm. go to meetings, go to Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, this and, this and this and smoking were in do- like endorsed by doctors for pregnant women. Like it's like, oh, you can have a couple of drinks, mm-hmm. or you can you can still smoke. And uh, you know, they they finally began to acknowledge the health risks by the by the seventies. Oh, there's that line in The Godfather when uh, was it Michael says, um, or, or the Godfather says, I drink wine more than I used to, and Michael says, Oh, it's good for you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, and uh, it. it it was seen as a sign of sophistication, mm-hmm. and its portrayal in in movies was as a comic as a comedy gimmick. Yeah, or just just fun. Um, one of the one of the movies that we're going to get to, and I, if if I get to pick around New Year's, uh, I'm going to do the Thin Man. Mm-hmm. That is just I have n- there. They didn't drink that much on Mad Men. Like, yeah, I'm like. Nick Charles yeah. should have been abs- should have just been pickled. He should have. Yeah. <laughs> Nick and Nora Charles. He, he, he yeah. gets. He takes a drink. I remember the one. Um, he like pours himself a drink in the morning. He goes, "It's just some a little something to cut the phlegm." Mm. I'm like, yeah. if you need to have a have a, a, a an alcoholic drink first thing in the morning, it's a miracle he can function as a detective as anything throughout the day. <laughs> and they wake up with hangovers. Yeah. And, and then they uh, drink to get rid of the hangover, a little bit of the hair of the dog that bit you, as they say. Right, uh, right. And, they, and they're chasing it, and it's it's, but it's seen as lighthearted fun. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Um, now, and that was me, the same same period as as last weekend. When I when I the rare times they even even do drink, it's usually I never drink in daylight. Um. But like I say, for me, it's not to get any kind of buzz. It's just the flavor and, you know, something, you know. But it's, um, he, then it was seen as, you know, a, a comedy thing. This was 20 years out from um, Otis the Town Drunk. Right, right, right. You know, you know the guy who, he goes out and he gets he gets pickled and then he comes and locks himself up in the jail cell. And it's all good fun right 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 and it's 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 and that that's definitely something that that was always through the through the 20s 30s 40s the 50s they started to call it like the, it started to be an issue and then in in the movies so people yeah. started to pay attention to it but they still only were, were like well, if I just get rid of all of the booze in the house, then that's all I really need to do. <laughs> like... Oh, let me tell you something. The history of this country, the history of our, the United States, is soaked in alcohol. Mm-hmm. Our founding fathers were drinking persistently. Mm-hmm. And um, that's because, uh, I mean, going back through time, wine was safer than water because it was fermented. And the, milk. the alcohol killed thing killed the bacteria that if you drank regular water, you'd probably get sick. Right. right. <laughs> and it was, and then of course in the the nineteen twenties they tried prohibition. That didn't work. No, people because drank, it only led people to... drank more in prohibition than they did when yeah. it was legal. <laughs> Who was the richest man during the during the Great Depression? Al Capone, uh-huh. because his chief business was out, was was uh, was bootleg liquor. Mm-hmm. You know? Where did the Kennedys make all their money? Right, so, um, uh, and liquor. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was it was it's it was just a big thing, and nobody really ever thought about it being a problem. Right. 
and nobody really when you got drunk you were just down and out right and and they i always love the representation like this this actually gives don time to mm. get drunk yeah whereas if you watch you know chaplin he takes one sip of a beer and he's <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, bubbles coming out of him and everything. Like, I get it for expediency, but it... <laughs> I like mean, a... the first film ever to win Best Picture, Wings, mm -hmm. has a scene where the soldiers are on are, are on leave in in France, and the guy starts downing champagne. He starts chasing the bubbles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it, it was played for comedy, and it was a it was a a, a workable comedy gimmick. And the people at the time, I, me I mentioned Mad Men, but if you, if you watch any of the movies from the 30s and 40s, if they, are, if they have any kind of functional living at all, if they have a steady income, mm -hmm. and they're at home, they have a drink in their hand. Right. And if you see them at the office... They have bars in their office. Mm -hmm. They're drinking throughout the day. Oh, the little mini bar, yeah. Yeah. And they'll offer when somebody comes in to meet with them, you know, would you like something to drink? Yeah. You know, I was actually surprised, um, my modern sensibilities. One of my favorite TV shows is MASH. Mm -hmm. They're drinking all the time. All the time. They're making they're making their own stuff. <laughs> yeah, they're distilling their own hooch and making and making martinis like that is always stronger than the stuff yeah. that you bought. And the commander has his own liquor cabinet. I yeah. mean, it's, yeah, you know, it's, um, and when somebody comes to visit, the first thing they do is offer them a drink, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, um, it's, it's an amazing history. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an amazing history. And, um, but we didn't really know, I guess it wasn't really taken seriously until the sixties and seventies. Um, what this did to your body right right and but this is this actually starts to talk about it because he said uh nat is like do you know what that stuff does to you and he goes yeah it's shrinking my liver mm -hmm. in a way yeah. that's kind of what cirrhosis is, is a hardening and shrinking of the liver making it ineffective at filtering poison but this is the first time that anybody ever actually said that in a movie I think. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the hardest portrayal of alcoholism until like what days of wine and roses mm -hmm. with uh, Lee Remick and, and, and Jack Lemmon, Jack Lemmon. Mm -hmm. um, which is also a very tragic and harrowing movie. <laughs> I like this one a lot better than that one. So do I, because I, I mean, days of wine and roses is very kind of, it's hammy. And it, it goes, yeah, it goes over the top with it, it. It does go over the top, but it actually tries to treat alcoholism as a disease. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's probably one of the first ones. And that was what, what early sixties. Yeah. So yeah. it, it took them, it took them almost 20 years to make another one like the lost week. <laughs> it's just not something that they decided people wanted to see. And this was post-war or, you know, just getting into the post-war era when people were coming home from the war, drinking, trying to look for jobs, down on their luck, and you know, Don Burnham was the the, the nice man who drinks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a guy. Who, he's. I'll be honest with you. I never sensed that this character was ever completely a nice guy. Was ever completely a, <laughs> a, an absolutely genial right. guy. Right? I have a feeling he was kind of a jerk before he started really drinking. <laughs> and this movie does not, like I say, this movie is no is not subtle about what he's going through. It's not subtle about how he's um it's it's not hinted at at all. Now, I read the book. I did not. In college and the, the crazy thing is the book, which was written by a, a forgotten writer named Charles Jackson, who went, who went through this. Mm -hmm. um, this was his, um, this was his story basically. In the book, <laughs> the Lost Weekend was was his the bottle. Yeah. Well, in 
but the book compounds the problem with the fact that he's also in the closet. Which would really make this a fascinating... Yeah, if they remade it, I think they would compound that, but um, it really is not um, up front. I mean, he's not having sex with men. He was... Um, in the book, he was he talks about when he was in college, hmm. and he had an infatuation with um, uh, with an athlete, with a a guy, and I think it was on the football team, hmm. and um, it's very subtle. It's you know something about he was he was shamed and disgraced. He got kicked out of college. Uh, hmm. He went home, and um, everybody knew what he did. Oh, so. I think that really is where it where it was bred. So he was bisexual and also an alcoholic. Um, so you're, you're kind of he didn't kill himself. He tried, um, tried, tried. And um, what's really interesting to me is, like I said earlier, is that you know that an addict will clear out spaces in their life for the, whatever they're addicted to. And he does. Eventually, he goes out to sell that typewriter. Mm-hmm. He's selling his livelihood, his life, his, his, the one thing that he's got to hold on to that he's good at. Right. And he's going out to sell this typewriter. And fortunately, fortunately, um, every, like I say, everything's closed. Um, he can't get to the pawn shop because it's, it's Sunday and it's closed. And it, that scene oh, no, is it's, painful. It's Saturday. He's it like, this, it's not Sunday, yeah, it's is it? Jewish holiday. It's, yeah. it's, it's Yom Kippur. So he's like, it's not Sunday, is it? Because he gets really panicked. And they're like, no. So he goes into to Nat's. And he's like, oh, let me have one. And he's like, no more credit. And he goes, all right, then a charity. Give me one. Yeah. And, he's, and that's when Nat says, you know, yeah, one's too many and a hundred's never enough. Which is the perfect summation of anything that you're addicted to. It's, yeah. it's, it's, once you start, you can't stop, but you mm-hmm. need to start or. Can't have just one. Right, right. It's, and not, not funny like Pringles. It's, it's. Actually, it was Lay's. Lay's? Mm-hmm. Is it, you know, you can't, um, nobody can eat just one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, the funny I was, thing is I was Nat... thinking Pringles, once you pop, you can't stop. N- Nat's an interesting character. Yeah. He has this weird accent. You know, he's always he has this weird sort of Brooklynite accent. Mm-hmm. You know, Mister Boynum. You know, <laughs> it almost sounds affected. It's it's kind of strange, but like I said, you know, when I was talking about how how we meet him in the middle of his addiction, mm-hmm. late in his addiction, that scene through Nat because Nat is tired of him. Mm-hmm. When he walks in, he looks sort of, oh boy, here's this guy again. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no. There's nothing genial. There's no friendship there at all. No. Don thinks that there is. Mm. But I guess when he's drunk, he thinks everybody's his friend. Right. Um, except and the he one does, that he steals the purse. Yeah. He does the one thing that bartenders hate from drunks. He starts to talk. Yeah. And when he starts to talk, he never shuts up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. And I I love uh, see we were talking about this before. Um, ha- at the end, it gives you the the auspice of a happy ending, like he's he's gonna get off of it. He was gonna kill himself, but uh, Helen dis- Helen quote unquote convinced him not to, and he's gonna turn it around. He's gonna write this book, and he's making all these grand plans, uh, and. Uh, Nat comes back with the typewriter. Uh, he said, I got something for you. You know, I, you, you left it somewhere and I, I oiled it up and it works pretty well. Mm-hmm. And uh, it looks like Don's come out the other side of this. Yeah. But then while he's talking, he's narrating over the end about, I wonder how many people there are just like me uh, on their way to the next bender. Just can't, can't wait to, to get their next drink. It's like, this isn't the last time this is going to happen to him. The, the it's cynicism. It's not a happy ending. It's, it's not. A... It gives you the idea of a happy ending, but 
it's it's one of those happy endings that if you let the movie run for another 15 minutes it It'll would not be a happy ending yeah it's it's so cynical billy wilder was brilliant at cynical filmmaking yeah uh, this ace in the hole double indemnity uh most of the apartment uh mm-hmm. you know his his cynicism at, at one two three mm-hmm. one, of, one of cagney's late performances um actually his penultimate performance even though it was 20 yeah. years before he did his last performance um which is something that we will talk about because I love that movie. <laughs> One thing, this is an this is a kind of performance most actors want to play, right? And this is weird because Meland is usually <clears throat> he's usually good, but he can be kind of hammy. Well, he's never been my favorite actor, and in in, right. in one of my favorite actors because there was always something mean about him. Mm-hmm. Um, there was always something kind of kind of cold. When he was uh, when he was starring in noir, that was fine. The one, uh, yeah, the, in the, noir, that was fine. Um, I don't remember him ever playing, but he's. You always sense a jerk mm-hmm. underneath the. I, I I. You always sense there's somebody that's extremely disagreeable under the under the surface, but you do sympathize for the guy when he's going out to sell a typewriter. This man is hurting. Mm-hmm. This man is in physical pain. You can, you can see the way that he's the way that he's shuffling, and uh, just he's he's so he's in he's in such disarray and disorganization. Like he's he's limping along, like he's like he's been injured, um, but he's really just in need of a drink. And it's it's really it's sad, yeah. um, but at the same time, um, you almost don't feel sorry for them. You you do and you don't. They're they're asking you to kind of have mixed feelings, yeah, about him, like. Yes, he's he's struggling with an addiction, and there's a there there's pain going on there. But it also kind of frames it in the way that he maybe decided to do this to himself, mm-hmm. like by deciding to drink, by deciding not to to um, go to the country with his brother. That would have been the big fix. That that would have made everything okay. Yeah. And you know it wouldn't. They they'd come back, and Wink would go out. And he'd he'd do the same thing. He'd go on another bender. Uh, Did you ever get the feeling that he's, while he's very much, um, while he's very much trying to get the next drink, you never feel that when he has the next drink that he's enjoying it. Right, he doesn't. He doesn't. He buys the the cheap stuff. He buys it specifically to be drunk. Not yeah. He's not. He's taste. not enjoying it. No. By the way, he's drinking rye. That's his his drink of choice. Mm-hmm. That stuff is nasty. <laughs> <laughs> it tastes like witch hazel. I mean, it's it's it's, it's a it's a, it's a very. It's close to PGA, isn't it? Right. If you if you uh, if you get the cheap stuff, it's like it's like buying you know cheap whiskey, mm-hmm. and you know you could you could probably like degrease an engine with it, but you shouldn't be drinking mm-hmm. it. Um, <laughs> but uh, or or uh, peeling paint, uh, you know. or um, oh, what's that stuff you put in your air conditioner? Um, Coolant. Yeah, the coolant. <laughs> Freon. Freon. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and there's there are people like he he's actually in the in the scope of of alcoholics of the time. He's a little bit better than some others because uh there was a there was a blues singer named Tommy Johnson, who was mm-hmm. Robert Johnson's cousin, who sang a song about drinking canned heat. Yeah. 
he he would drink a, a sterno for the for Ew. the alcohol Ew. and that's that's where the band canned heat got their name from um Ew. yeah <laughs> so, i know what that stuff smells like yeah it's not uh, it's not a pleasant smell but uh just think about being so desperate that you that you're drinking it that you're drinking it well here's the other thing is while he is addicted to alcohol did you ever notice he's addicted to rye because he doesn't drink anything else. Yes, because it's, it's not the like, cheapest thing. It, it's not like he's going out and drinking martinis or whiskey or rum or any of that other stuff. He's stuck on rye. He's stuck on this. Uh, and of course, like you say, he's... He goes to that club, though, and he's he's drinking um, he's drinking a gin vermouth. Yeah. Well, I mean, for lar- in large part, he seems to be generally stuck on the, on the rye, on the cheap mm-hmm. stuff. And, it's because um, he's not he's not drinking it for the taste. If he were drinking it for, um, the uh, the taste or the 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 quality of it to savor it, he mm-hmm. wouldn't just be buying shots or buying quarts and downing it. He would be savoring it. He would be going slowly. He wouldn't just be buying it to be drunk. Well, I'm thinking of um, this film's spiritual cousin which is of course leaving las vegas mm-hmm. um in which you know you see nicholas cage he's dancing through the uh, the grocery store mm-hmm. and he's getting everything mm-hmm. i mean he's loading up the garden the grocery cart with everything under the sun and it doesn't matter what he drinks as long as he gets drunk mm-hmm. so the choice um is he's even spaced out in his life, even spaced away from what he prefers. It's just whatever gets him there fastest. Mm -hmm. Now with this character, it's the rye with the Ben character in that movie. It was just anything, anything, anything and everything, anything and everything, whatever he could get a hold of, Mm -hmm. um, which that's a magnificent picture too. Yes, it is. Yes. Um, the three, movies that really deal with this the best this one under the volcano and leaving las vegas Mm -hmm. i think are the three best at dealing with this in a serious way in a serious (laughs) realistic way when 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 you're dealing with with under the volcano with john houston writing and directing albert finney uh who knows more who knew more about liquor than those two people (laughs) exactly (laughs) like well i mean um Billy Wilder's inspiration for this came from uh, Raymond Chandler. Mm-hmm. Again, the drunken writer. Yeah. Um, and he had been an alcoholic in the 30s. He'd given it up, and then Wilder saw firsthand Chandler going right back to it. Mm-hmm. And uh, really, that's where this, this idea came from. Charles Jackson, um, I, think he, I think he committed suicide. He didn't live very long. He's 46 when he died. Mm. He was actually working on a sequel to this called Farther and Wider, oh, wow. which he never finished. And uh, this, is, this is his only legacy mm-hmm. because he had these problems. He was an alcoholic. He was bisexual. He was um, – and I, I don't know if, if those two things were compounded on, on top of each other. But I wouldn't be surprised given the time. Well, given the times, I'm sure he, he drank a lot because he had to – hide part of himself right you know from from the world because it just wasn't accepted uh so yeah i mean i i I would wager that you know he had an addictive personality and he he started drinking and that helped him forget about him not being able to be his true self and then that became as much a part of him as everything else i'm glad you brought that up because um some people have an addictive personality, and some people don't. I right. said, basically, you can get a, you can get addicted to anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I know people who are addicted who are addicted to video games. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know people who are addicted to. Um, I know people who are addicted to internet porn. I know people who are. You can get addicted to anything. I know a couple of people it, who are addicted to movies. Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know anything about that, but. Um, <laughs> Well, the addiction just basically that's all you think about. That's all that's on your mind. That's all you um and you're you're making yourself 
um, the, there it becomes a destructive force in your life mm-hmm. to the point that you you can't think about anything else. You can't function without it. Mm-hmm. Um, I know people who are addicted to sports. Um, and uh, one film that I'm going to recommend at the end is very much about that. And uh, but it is it's in some people can pull themselves away from it. Some people can't. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember um, and this this maybe a kind of a spurious comparison, but I remember when my brother and I were, were kids, I could turn off the video games Mm -hmm. and my brother had a little bit more difficult time doing that. You pull yourself away from it. You say, okay, I'm, I gotta stop. Right. I got other things to do. And some people just, now there are some people that just get addicted to anything. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, they they don't see the line. They don't see the 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 the, the things that go on, and it's um, but it is. It's it's an addiction, and a lot of times when a person is addicted to something, they don't realize that they're addicted to it Mm-mm. for a long time, and uh, if ever, uh, if ever, they don't realize it's a problem until way late. Mm-hmm. I would I would wager to say that Don Burnham probably didn't realize this was a problem um, until somebody brought it. And even then, you know, he he played along like it was a problem, but then he started to feel the shame mm-hmm. of doing it, and he knew what it was doing to the people around him, but he just couldn't stop. Did you ever notice there aren't many people around him? No, there's there's Wink and Helen, and uh, um, Gloria and sort of, and Nat, and that's that's about it. And Wink or Wick and uh, and Nat really just put up with him. Mm-hmm. They just put up with him. Wick has to be around him because he's his brother, and Nat Nat just kind of puts up with him because um, because he comes into the bar and he spends money. Mm-hmm. But he's not un. But Nat is not uncaring. He's sort of giving him this ugly look. But there is a feeling of, do you know what you're doing to yourself? Right. He'll. He'll. There was the uh, at one point when he was going to be leaving on the train. He's like, Mister Boynum, you should probably go home now. Yeah. And he's like, Well, why didn't you tell me? He goes, What do you think I've been doing for the last half hour? Yeah. What do you think I've been doing for the last half hour? Like he he wants to help him because his business isn't. He's the kind of guy that his his personal business, Nat's Bar, is not as important as someone's life to him. Right. Right. Um, he will willingly not get money from this one individual if it means that that one individual will continue to live. So while this film is dark and it is cynical, it is not inhuman. Right. Because it would have been it would have been easy to cast a bartender as being the devil. Mm-hmm. You know, always parceling out. Why don't you have you one know. more drink, Mister Boynum? You got yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. It, it would have been very easy. It's much more difficult and much more dramatic to cast him as a human being who just. Why are you doing this to yourself? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't. I don't like. There's... He's like. I don't like how you're treating your brother, and I don't like how you're treating that nice late, that nice woman. Mm. Yeah, there's a great line in Leaving Las Vegas. It's just it, it goes right along with that. Richard Richard Lewis says, "If you could see what I see, you wouldn't do this to yourself." Mm-hmm. And um, it's it, it, they, so there are people around him, but in both cases, in this film and Leaving Las Vegas, there's a very finite number of people who still exist in his hemisphere Mm -hmm. in his 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 um in his world because everybody else has given up right you don't hear from an agent you don't hear from somebody that he's working with you don't hear from um you don't you don't hear from mom and dad you don't hear from um you know anybody else it's nat it's helen it's wick Mm mm-hmm because these are the people who have not given up. Helen is the most good-hearted woman. Oh my god. <laughs> she is. I mean, oh my god, she is like she sticks with him. She through thick and thick. She she should be nominated for a a, 
sainthood. This oh my god, she should be canonized for this because she's just the stuff she takes from him. Mm. It's just I I I was I, I I really didn't know where to where to go with his character because I'm thinking. Why are you not lashing out at him? Because he's treating you like crap. Why is she even still there? Why is she still even... She has no reason to be there, really. No, no. She Other has than the fact a, that she loves him. She has a good job, and, you know... Yeah, but, you know, as the song goes, sometimes love just ain't enough. Right. Uh, it's, she's, she's, she's a little too faithful to him. Mm-hmm. And while I, I get... It's it's interesting because it's there could be a story told from her perspective, and it would be uh, a woman living in an abusive relationship, which this is which this essentially is. Yeah, I mean, but you would be able to see it from her perspective and and what it's doing to her. She sleeps on his stairwell, mm-hmm. waiting for him to come back. You know. I mean, oh, that, and then um, there's that scene at the end, uh, that amazing scene where she meets up with the the housekeeper or the landlady, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and the la- the landlady tells her, you know, I've I've known for years that he has he has a problem. I hear the bottles clinking when I take when I take out the garbage, mm-hmm. you know, and all of this. And she really, um, you can tell she's kind of a Gladys Kravitz. Yeah, she kind of keeps her ear to the wall and keeps looking, keeps peeking out the curtains. Right. In the book, he was thinking about killing her. What? <laughs> Money wow. to take the 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 uh, the rent back, and uh, so I mean that that's how far in the book he went. And wow. This one it doesn't quite go that far, but um, but she knows he's got a problem, mm-hmm. and uh, but yeah, the the <laughs> Helen's such a good woman. <laughs> <It's just> like... <laughs> he does not deserve her at all. No, no, not at all. And um, I, I want to tell you one thing. We talked a little bit about this when we talked about The Shining. As much as I sympathize with him about the um, about the alcohol, I really felt bad for him that he wasn't getting any work done. Yeah. He spaces out a weekend to sit down with the ty- at the typewriter, and you see him sitting at his typewriter typing. And I'm thinking, okay, he's he's finally getting work, finally getting to write his book, but then he stops, mm-hmm. and I'm like, no, you've got a weekend, write your book. <laughs> <laughs> as a writer, you know, as as a person who writes, I kind of get that. Oh yeah, yeah. It's like you know, no, when you've got the time spaced out, take it. And he doesn't. It's it's like he gets there and he stops. And by the way, that's what he's going to write about at the end of the book, at the end of the movie, is he's going to write a book about... Um, eff- effectively, he's going to write the story of this movie. It's really... The, the, that's such a self-reflexive way to do things. It's, if it, it's, it's exactly like, you know, you get to, you get to his book, and then you've, you've got the book that gets turned into the movie that you just watched... Right. And it's it's all kind of really cyclical that, you know, he's going to write the book. It, yeah, it's 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 meta before they knew what meta was. Right. Um, and it's it's kind of fascinating. It, not kind of. It's it's definitely fascinating that uh, Wilder took a lot of those kinds of aspects the 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 breaking of the fourth wall um sunset boulevard uh the dead man narrating his own story yeah <laughs> like how on He's telling earth? the story yeah <laughs> we're we're getting we're getting we're getting a story from a from a from a dead man from a from a from a spirit from a corpse from a man who's laying face down floating face up face down in a pool in a swimming pool it's like we know how this ends yet he's still telling us his story right i mean very few people could get away with that yeah and or know how to handle it well yeah yeah um because i think another director a a sort of director for hire would have probably ended this story announcing that he's never going to drink again and you know they get married and you know, they go off together, and that, mm-hmm. that's how the movie would have ended. Mm-hmm. This movie has such a question mark at the end. It's like he, he claims he's going to write a book about this, 
and it's sort of indicated that he's done with the alcohol, but you kind of know that by the weekend he's going to be right back in it. Yeah. He's, he's, he's one afternoon alone from going back through this uh, right. because you know, he, he probably did the same thing 10 days before at the end of his last one, when he was kind of coming to his senses and he felt terrible and you know, he probably dumped out the last of his, the last of his rye or, whatever but he still had them hanging out all over the place so you know he when he says i haven't touched the stuff in 10 days he's been touching the only way this is going to work for him is if he sells his apartment and moves like to the country just move well that's not even his apartment that's wick's apartment he can can just move out (laughs) <laughs> but you know what i'm saying yeah just moved out to the middle of nowhere where you can't get it um sell you have it you have it set up so that you have your groceries delivered and that no no the only one liquor store in town will not give you anything <laughs> right right i mean so it's yeah it's it's a. Uh, you're supposed to take it as they say one day at a time um but then, then you get into the the situation where uh, my wife's been watching the Golden Girls a lot lately, and there's this one episode where Dorothy is addicted to gambling, and mm-hmm. she goes, "You just have to take it one one day at a time." And Rose says, "Well, you'd have to, otherwise you'd just be changing your underwear constantly." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And um, it's just it's it's it, what's interesting to me is. And maybe, maybe you can clear this up. Maybe I missed it. Does the movie ever really give you an indication of how he started? No. He just is. He's just right. He, like I said, when when he starts talking about how the story starts, mm-hmm. he's already an alcoholic in the beginning of the flashback. where he thinks the the story starts. Right. It's the it's the story with he and Helen, not the story of how the bottle became his best friend. He talked about um, being in college and how the one thing that he wrote, um, how he would get the, all these short stories out and everything. The, the the school paper couldn't publish without one of his stories, but then he just started getting crippled by anxiety. And he would be like, well, let's just, just take a drink to, to calm you down. And then nothing would get written because he would be sloshed. Mm-hmm. And so it, it he does kind of say that it starts in college because mm-hmm. of the, the pressures and the demand of, of his talent um, were too much for him. Yeah. Um, so there is there is that illusion. We don't get to see it, but he, he does talk about it. Yeah. Um, I was looking for subtle hints of the bisexuality in the story because, um, back then the, the idea of homosexuality was not even discussed in film. It was not, it was not even part of the film. It It would not have been part of the production. It was parodied in some things. Oh, like, very much like so. the Maltese Falcon, and and you know you'll you'll get uh, two people, two two guys, uh, you know, be being stereotypically bitchy mm-hmm. or something, and you know. If well, in in Maltese Falcon, hands. it was more coded. It that was, was more coded was. gay. But I, I'm listening around the edges of the dialogue to try and find something, some indication that this is a problem. The only thing I can really draw from this is that he has no real interest in Helen. Mm. He's he's not interested in Helen at all. She's just and that's really she's there. That's really just part of the part of the addiction. But mm-hmm. um it's sort of scrubbed clean from this story. Mm-hmm. And um it's not really even a massive function of the book. It's there, you know it is, but it's it's hanging over him. Mm-hmm. It's mentioned in this flashback structure, but you're not really sure. Uh, you're not really sure that that's the problem because he doesn't say it. 
Mm -hmm. You just know it's compounding on top of the drinking. Mm -hmm. And um, it, that's a, that would have been th – this this idea of dealing with alcoholism in this way, as you say, was revolutionary in the 1940s. Mm -hmm. So to compound that with a um, – uh, with the sexual frustration like this would have really been – you know, and yeah. I don't think people would have been able to accept it. I don't think it would have gotten past the censors. The, the right, because you didn't really, really genuinely did not start dealing with this until the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, with movies like, we were talking about this last night, um, movies like The Children's Hour and Victim and, you know, Advising Consent, mm -hmm. which dealt with that subject as a horror show. Yeah, oh, yeah. You know, your... Um, your your fate, your destiny in that is a brutal, ugly death. Right. Alcoholism, they dealt with it in two ways. They dealt with it like The Lost Weekend, or they dealt with it like um, as, a, as a comedy thing. And they dealt with homosexuality the same way. Right. Either it was deep and dark and there's no way out, or they dealt with it as a stereotypical um, comedy element. Mm-hmm. So this film, it's not a lot of fun. I'll just say that. It's, it's not a it's lot of so fun. It's so odd when I, when, I, when I think about it as, and it is one of my favorite movies, mm -hmm. I feel weird about that because there's nothing in it that's particularly enjoyable, but it's such a riveting film. Mm -hmm. And the, the performance and the, and the way that Wilder directs the the bold camera moves and the way that he angles things and uh, the distance that you get from Don Burnham by being up close with him is a, is a, is a really kind of a fascinating way to, to, to have a character uh, to have an actor interplaying with the, with the camera because the closer the camera gets to Burnham, the farther away Ray Milan makes you feel he is. Do you get the feeling watching this? Um, and I, I was watching this last night, and I was like, I don't want to be in the same room with this guy. Right. I'm sitting there, you know, I, I'm, and th that goes into what you were just saying. It's like you don't, you know, you're closer to him, but you don't, you don't want to be in the same room with. He's him. not an endearing character. No, not in at the, all. In the beginning, in the middle, or at the end. Um. But it, it's because you get the feeling he brings this on himself. Mm -hmm. But the movie is not unsympathetic. Right. Um, like I say, that scene where he's walking around looking for the pawn shop, the pawn is typewriter. The man is in pain. Mm -hmm. And it's almost unbearable. It's it's difficult. It's difficult to watch. And, and it's the, the, the scene when he's in gnats with the typewriter hanging over it drenched in sweat yeah desperate mm -hmm. you know at night this is a drink but in the morning it's medicine right you know to yeah. to help cure the 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 hangover that he's got it's just it's 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 really sad and uh, you know I, th I think from there, I think we can maybe move into to recommendations. Um, I would say if you're looking for things that go that deal with addiction in general, this was kind of the kickoff to a lot of things like you would end up getting um, train spotting and Requiem for a Dream and Leaving Las Vegas and... Hard I was going to mention stuff. train spotting <laughs> because you know when I said people can get addicted to anything, uh -huh. that movie has an interesting element to it. They're all heroin addicts, yeah, except for this one friend who is addicted to violence. Mm -hmm. So again, you can get addicted to anything, and right. you can have a portrait of anybody who's addicted to anything. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I forgot to mention that. <laughs> so I mean, those those I would definitely if you're if you're if you're looking to be exceedingly depressed and. Uh, just feeling like, you know, you just don't want to, uh, you, 
get addicted to live anything. anymore <laughs> yeah if you just if you're like gee i i, I don't think be drinking too much would be all that bad put in those movies and <laughs> witness witness the, the the downward spiral of excess uh what, what do you have um absolutely um a wonderful movie from a couple of years ago called big fan mm-hmm Starring Patton Oswalt in his best performance ever. Yeah, it's it's, um, it's he a plays, wonderful performance. He plays a toll worker at a, at a parking garage who is absolutely addicted to the New York Giants. Mm-hmm. And so much so that, again, he spaces himself away from everything. He gets in an incident in which he sees a player um, commit a crime. But his his loyalty to the team and his addiction to the New York Giants is such that he won't testify, mm-hmm. that he won't do the right thing. And he gets the crap it, beat out of him. He gets yeah, yeah. He gets the crap beat out of him when he witnesses a crime. Right. It's such a good performance. It's, it's so such good. a good movie. I wish more people would find it that is. one. It is. Um, there's there's that, and and that actually uh, reminded me of. Um, there was a um, owning Mahoney, the yeah. uh, um, Philip Seymour Hoffman movie that he's he's addicted to gambling, or even Don John. Don John, which or... is about a guy who's addicted to internet porn. Now mm-hmm. that was the film, uh, the directorial debut of Joseph Gordon-Levitt, and it's really good. Who's no dummy because the woman that he cast as his girlfriend, Scarlett Johansson. So mm-hmm. he's. <laughs> And it's a it's a really good movie. And Julianne Moore, I mean. And Julianne Moore. Um, and then there's um, another another one with Philip Seymour Hoffman. Philip Seymour Hoffman tragically did a lot of movies about addiction, which he does such a good job at because he was struggling with it. Um, the there was a movie called Love Liza. His wife commits suicide. And uh, he he reads this That's note. A tough he gets picture. it is he gets he gets addicted to huffing gasoline. Mm. That's a that's a tough movie. It's very hard. Uh, it's, I don't know if I could recommend it, but his performance alone is is worth the pain of going through that movie. Um, yeah. So I think I think that about. Do you have any others? No, I, I okay. think that was it. Big okay. Fan is the one that I, I hope Big people will find. Big Fan is really good. Um, absolutely. If you want to do a trilogy of this and really be depressed, again, <laughs> The Lost Weekend, Under the Volcano, and Leaving Las Vegas. Leaving Las Vegas is probably the most honest. Yeah. But it's also the most extreme. I mean, it's about a man who goes into the den of Las Vegas to drink himself to death. Right, right. He goes in there explicitly to end his life through liquor right. um so uh, <laughs> i think i think that about wraps it up here for us on the pod bay doors jerry what do we have coming up we're going from drinking to disney uh <laughs> <laughs> and we're not talking about pink elephants next week no, we're not doing uh, dumbo We've... we're not doing dumbo next week we are going to delve into one of the strangest sections of disney history we're going to talk about the disney renaissance um we are going to talk uh we're going to do this in two parts um we're going to talk about the little mermaid Mm -hmm. the rescuers down under we're going to and then we're going to talk about beauty and the beast and then two weeks after that we're going to do part two in which we are going to talk about um what are we talking about (laughs) We're going to talk about Aladdin, The Lion King, and I'm going to force Doug to watch Pope again. Mm. <laughs> and in between that, I have chosen a, 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 a back-to-back header, a double header of Ingmar Bergman to celebrate his uh, centennial birthday that was on uh, July the 14th. Um, uh, smiles of a summer night and summer. Always do these Monica. late. Don't we? <laughs> <laughs> well, see, I ju- I just wanted to do them because they were both summer movies, and yeah. then I found out um, when it when it got st- stuck in the schedule where it was, uh, I f- I later discovered that it was <laughs> yeah. Bergman's centennial year, and I was like, oh well, at least we're doing it kind of close. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, and we're doing another one for Christmas, so yeah. 
And if madness strikes me and I want to talk about Hercules, Mulan, and Tarzan, we may do that later. That depends on <laughs> if I kill you first, if you decide to... Depending upon how you react <laughs> to your viewing of Pocahontas. You, you can be, at least, even if you hate Pocahontas, at least it's only 81 minutes long. I That's mean... true. That's true. <laughs> and then following that, uh, in the first week of September, we will be... Uh, commemorating the 50th uh, anniversary of the uh, riots at the Democratic National Convention in 1968, which took place between August 27th and August 30th, I think, in uh, 1968 with the film Medium Cool, which was partially shot we're during... We're celebrating the, the anniversary of a riot. We're not celebrating, we're commemorating. <laughs> commemorating the <laughs> anniversary of a riot. We're remembering... <laughs> so that we don't repeat it we have to remember these things only on the five bay doors <laughs> you know let me tell you something there are two things you never want to know how they're made sausage and this show <laughs> <laughs> well and laws yeah <laughs> Politics. Because if you're because if you're a fan of either, witnessing witnessing their creation will destroy your passion for both. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, we're gonna do Haskell Wexler's uh, Medium Cool, which I'm gonna finally get you around to seeing. Um, but first, Disney. Yes, but first, <laughs> first Disney and Bergman. Um, so that's where we have we're 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 out to the beginning of September, uh, but we'll always take recommendations uh and and fit them in where uh where we're able to uh just let us know in the in the comments uh in an email uh at the pod bay doors podcast at gmail.com uh you can find all of our back episodes at the pod bay doors podcast wordpress.com you can find us on twitter at pod underscore bay you can find us on patreon at pod underscore bay where you can throw us a, a a virtual tip in our virtual tip jar uh we greatly uh appreciate anything uh if you if you have anything to give we greatly appreciate it uh it's not a requirement to access what we have on patreon right now um it is just appreciated um other than that spread the word uh we would love to get as many listeners as possible and uh, we thank you very much for listening. On behalf of myself, Doug Heller, film critic, film historian for TalkMovieToMe.com, and Jerry Dean Roberts, film critic for ArmchairCinema.com, ArmchairOscars.com, and OverthinkingOscars.wordpress.com. Uh, is that a, is that the whole thing of it? Over That's the whole thing. Okay. That's the whole Megillah. All right. <laughs> uh, thank you very much again for, for listening in the Pod Bay Doors are now closed. The mission has been completed. See the long